honor to uh, have you all here and speak about a topic of my heart um, and exchange some, yeah, some thoughts and some hopefully some inspirations regarding um, one life and many lives around skiing and around yeah connection with nature from different perspectives. So, so I'm starting here with a slide from Hokkaido, Japan. This is an abandoned ski area in. Uh, Japan and the title building is key positive climate positive future uh, was uh, yeah co-designed by uh, Kathy to have a, a catchy name here and the positiveness I think is imminent in how I think we should go on this topic um, it is um, yeah it is in, in a positive way it is not um, in a kind of you know negative way of all the problems that we have but taking those problems serious and then thinking about the beauty of designing solutions around this and I think there is a beauty in it. Japan here I've been there a couple of times um, and I'm coming back later to this but this used to be also my normal hunting the snow line and being an avid skier um, I grew up having no idea about Japan I was even um, yeah, not educated at all about this culture. So basically, I grew up with thinking, you know, the Japanese uh, industry is uh, copying our German cars and there's like cheap Nippon steel and all this um, nonsense that um, I, you know, was, was a lack of knowledge. And then I decided to go to Japan to ski in Hokkaido and invest 3.2 tons of carbon emission equivalents for the, about 19,000 kilometers of flight. And it made me to the biggest fan of Japan, the Japanese culture. So I want to set this a bit in context on our discussion. Yes, it is an absolute emergency to act much more than any of us has done so far on climate action and for sustainability. But same time, we should be aware that there's also, yeah, um, a kind of social side involved where sports that we love that keep us healthy, where cultural interaction, I think also deserves a conscious kind of carbon footprint, but we have to think about the entire budget. Um, and I get back to this later on. So I invested 3.2 tons of carbon emissions that time, and I'm the biggest fan of Japanese culture. Is it all about carbon? So carbon as a chemical element is a, um, a very important currency to think about the consequences of us and our, yeah, our hobby or even our profession of skiing and much more than skiing, obviously. We're talking here about a luxury problem. Um, and carbon is imminent in, in two things, also in my little kind of introduction here. It's one carbon emissions, CO2, as we can see. Obviously, that's what we are trying to avoid um, because of human-induced global warming. But we are also looking at carbon in materials. And on the left side, you can see uh, a carbon composite in many skis, in um, many products, many light sporting products, for example, carbon. And carbon is a huge problem, carbon composites, both because of the embodied energy, the embodied carbon footprint in the material that is needed to produce it, but also the difficulty to recycle it. So we're having two main elements here of carbon. Um, we're trying to reduce carbon as such, uh, not only from mobility and traveling, but also in materials, in gray energy, but we also try to maximize the sequestration of carbon to take it off the atmosphere. So this is an example um, just um, seeing here oops, um, in the social media the last days when the, uh, since the, some ski areas are closed in the Alps and then there's this creative people, uh, mad cow so-called here to um, just put this propeller on the back and there's interesting videos of zooming up a ski area and all the ski tourists, us basically are standing and wondering um, what this guy is doing. So that's of course um, 
Yeah, I think it's it's just the first signal of an outburst that we might see in the coming time as soon as you know this pandemic is under more control about raging out to nature even more than what we have seen last summer. And this is understandable and neat and beautiful. It also creates a couple of issues and problems. We're going to go back to this as well. More time and more space. What is the essence of skiing? And I think we should look a bit back um, in our fast moving days. Right now, it's a lot of computer indoor days. And I think it reminds us on the essence of why we ski. And it's not about hunting for more and more. It's more about enjoying the real beautiful feelings before, during, and after. This is a um, picture taken in Greenland, glaciers, uh, Disco Island. And to me, it shows a bit the essence. It's not only space and time, no crowds. It shouldn't be Greenland in terms of travel emissions. That's something of the past. Um, it's telemark skiing. It's a very original, beautiful style of skiing. And it's with nice people. So I'm uh, structuring this little 45 minutes more or less here um, with some uh, ski touring terms. Uh, the beacon check, everybody does a beacon check, the avalanche transceiver. And with the powder alert, I want to start with the vision. As I said before, I think we should take the energy of positiveness, of engaging and taking the energy that we feel when we are in nature and when we ski and take this energy and focus first on the beauty. Of course, we do that because we know we have to act. And then the melting snow. I'm not uh, planning to go deep into describing the problems. I do think the problems are sufficiently described and communicated. I want to focus on solution potential and, um, and just getting a bit of a reminder on, on where we come from, where I started. Then we have the fresh tracks and the fresh tracks is about the kind of systems change, the transformation that is urgently needed and where we are part of, we are co-designers of this change systemic change. And the guiding complex terrain is a bit, um, yeah, what is that exactly? What does it mean? You know, what steps should we take in all together? What are the concrete things that each of us should work on? And then we end the ski day, the ski train, the hot tub, obviously a dream, ideally solar powered. Um, and uh, yeah, we let the, the thoughts flow a bit, relax and see what we can take home. So. Let's start here, powder alert, vision number one. In the future, it might be in a couple of years, the sooner the better. Reminder, the UN decade of sustainable development um, is until 2030. So we are right now in the UN decade of local and people action, which means I'm gonna use this vision for the agenda 2030, so 10 years from now. And first part of this is that we won the race to decarbonize our consumption. This is some data from 2020, or published 2020 from 2018. And you can see here where our you know, Western countries are um, in terms of um, carbon emissions from energy use per capita, so per person per year. And we see that we are depending here, where's UK, here uh, about five, five, six something tons per person per year. And um, it goes up and it depends obviously what kind of calculation we look at. This is from energy use, but still we see, um, you know, the average here, we are way beyond what we're supposed to do. So we're supposed to be around two or three uh, tons per person. And so in this vision in 10 years, we won the race and we are around this level per person per year. Remember, one flight to Japan is three tons, it's about this. We also managed to change a bit our skiing behavior and our ski travel, um, especially as you mentioned at the beginning from a place like UK where you gotta travel further to reach 
these beautiful mountains or mountain Scandinavia. And so this is a map of migration balance. And you can see blue, it's a couple of years old, but blue means people are leaving or have been leaving these regions, especially in the Eastern part of the Alps and positive is red. And this has changed over the years. Obviously there was a huge um, loss and, and kind of out migration here in the Western part. Um, and it's, it's scatters, it's, it's really different depending on uh, how you zoom in. But in this vision, in 10 years, we achieved that we, we as skiers, also from further away, became stakeholders in a new Alpine urban community revival. Meaning we're not just visitors who zoom in and zoom out, but we develop partnerships with a region that we really like, that we invest in, where we travel less often, but we stay longer. We stay longer, we develop a relation and we give back to the place. We are part of regenerating this kind of skiing place that then will become more of just a visitor place. It will become part of our home. And this has in 10 years changed our attitude and our connection to skiing and to the place. We benefit from the positive part of this pandemic shock, and that's really changing our work environment and our freedom to use virtual tools to work from wherever, not for everyone, unfortunately, but for many. And if we just use that potential in 10 years, we will be using it in full power. So we can stay longer in a place in the mountains where we travel less and we develop a relation with the place, with the community and work from there, many of us at least. So this brings more skiing time and less time spending in traffic. We also gained solidarity in balancing tourism intensity after pandemics. <clears throat> Said in the beginning, what we saw this summer um, over tourism local people in mountains who got really yeah, annoyed by all the cars, by the intensity of floods of people and many new people who didn't go, come to the mountains before. So in the beauty of bringing people back to nature is also, of course, a problem um, inherent. And so in 10 years, we managed this kind of solidarity, both we as visitors and tourists, having a different connection, a different relation with people who live in the mountains. When we visit their backyard, their garden, their habitat, and people in mountains have a different relation with tourists, um, obviously, because we understand that people wanna go out in the mountains. But this kind of relation in 10 years latest will have changed and will have driven to the better. We also got more flexible as ski tourists. I know, I know very well that the powder in Hokkaido is the best I've ever skied in my life and I want it back all the time. But that's a bit of the past. So there's so much to do here as well. There's a picture three days ago in Zurich where I live right now. And the road on the left is closed because of the biggest snowfalls in 15 years. And people here called about a flock down, not a lockdown, Flock is flake, snowflake in German. So this was so cool. You know, we skied from house, from the house in the city, and you saw people skiing cross country, back country ski touring, snowboarding, whatever, that you normally wouldn't see. And the traffic was gone to some part. So in 10 years will be much the normal will be that we take advantage of flexible ad hoc micro adventures. It doesn't have to be always that big super powder or that monster ski tour, we are also happy with just being outside in the snow and be healthy and move. In 10 years, diversity is the new activity. So there's so many other cool things to do out there, often in our backyard, like in the city. I guess also in UK, in many places, it's not the big ski touring powder, but Snow kiting, have you ever done ski snow kiting or snowboards snow kiting with uh, more and more winds also due to climate change? It's a beautiful sport and you need very little snow and you can do it in the flat. Um, dog sledding, beautiful, the connection with these animals, being pulled on skis like skiering or just being with the animals in snow, 
it can be done in the flat, even with little snow, even with patchy snow. So diversity will be the new activity and ski touring whenever possible, but not for any price. Less is more. This was a couple of days ago here in Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's um, not like in my student times with a hundred ski days per season. It was like the kind of you know, goal to have. Um, and now it's much more quality than quantity. And even one good day once in a while is so valuable um, that I say, um, yeah, it's, one has to get adjusted to a new rhythm, but less is more. And uh, in 10 years, I think this will be part of our normal. The next generation of skiers, I have for years wondered why in big glacier resorts in the Alps, young kids are carried, are driven with vans, with full equipment, fully sponsored equipment to the ski areas. And all they get to see is huge quantitative growth and consumption and construction as the normal. It's not the normal. The normal is here. It used to be the normal, it will be the normal again. These are backcountry skis with pattern, with a very light wider Nordic binding. We developed a concept at the, at the German Ski Federation um, 10 years ago or more, 12, 13 years ago, about snow sports and education for sustainability. And with these simple tools, a kid, a young person can learn any kind of skiing style, skating, uh, classic, uh, touring, telemark, parallel, um, jibbing in the park, touring, etc. All in even mid mountain ranges, just out of the door with very little equipment and leading to a different mindset that um, it's, it takes energy to earn the turn. And this should be the normal again, to know where the energy comes from and also have that feeling that we have as ski tourists, which not many skiers have who never hiked and climbed up and still have the energy to ski down in a fun and fluent way. In 10 years, we will grow our own skis. And um, yeah, we heard that uh, we developed skis for years. We're developing skis not for the sake of developing or pushing in another ski brand into the market. We have way too many products and brands and companies out there. What we're trying to do is develop better alternatives that would nudge the industry to change their production for more regenerative products. And so what you see here on the left side is an existing ski from hemp fiber composites. This is the most eco-friendly construction we have on the market. Next step in 10 years, I think we will grow our composite materials from mycelium and uh, have a hemp mycelium um, composite that might even just need some fish protein glue and some oak bark tannin powder to make it waterproof and will be fully recyclable um, and carbon negative. So I think that will be the new normal. The homes we live in in our vision for 2030 will be passive, passive energy and net positive. So they will be so insulated that we don't almost don't need any heating, even in winter. They will have healthy materials inside um, and it will be um, fully renewable and recyclable and circular. Um, that I think will be the new normal. Also in our um, question, what we can do as ski tours um, in 2030, what we will have done our equipment, our gear is circular. So um, we don't buy all this new stuff all the time. Uh, fashion, at least in outdoor sports, is something from the past. Uh, it's about the circularity index, um, how circular our gear is. And this is just an example from France, outdoor waste lab. They are um, circle, where they're using the waste of different outdoor product, gothic jackets, etc., cetera, um, sleeping bags, whatever to make, you know, new outdoor gear from old outdoor gear. So circular gear, the new normal, late in 10 years. Let's also not forget about, of course, energy traveling. This is still the biggest emittent in terms of climate change impacts. And um, yeah, 
we presume, we don't consume, but we presume by real-time carbon flows in 2030. This is a map that's just popped up interestingly today on LinkedIn. It's electricity map. And uh, it shows real-time open data flows. You can see the arrows here between countries and how energy flows. And it shows, in this case, Great Britain. So the um, gram uh, carbon emissions per kilowatt hour, I think, electricity, yes. And it shows um, um, the kind of regeneration potential and the general um, CO2 uh, potential in here. And so it shows how this flows in between countries. And this kind of real-time carbon flows management um, with artificial intelligence, big data, will be the normal to steer our decisions at least give the basis for our decisions, which hopefully are still human and personal. Individual mobility in 10 years is 100% renewable, electric. Um, it is, of course, not just individual cars, but whatever we do, uh, the mobility we have will be 100% renewable, no question. And luckily, it's already on a fast way to there. Also, we as ski tours and other outdoor sport people, um, we will contribute, or in 2030, we are contributing with the data to mountain resilience. So this webpage here, Adventure Scientist, it exists, and uh, there's much more observation, social ecological observation needed in mountain places. And we as ski tours, we're getting everywhere. So um, in 10 years from now, it will be the normal that we are on free will, collecting and sharing data that helps us to get these real-time, for example, carbon flows, also biodiversity assessment, habitat protection, um, 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 yeah, kind of natural hazards protection for skiers as well. So there will be a lot happening with big data, obviously in a private, safe context. Also in 10 years, Talking about ski touring, ski instructors and mountain guides will um, not just do their thing on snow because snow just is becoming more and more rare. And so we need to be more resilient, more diverse, more flexible, more innovative, which means these colleagues will be for season service providers. They will be educators, co-designers with visitors, connecting visitors and locals, looking for joint experiences regarding regional and translocal regeneration. So this is already today or 10 years ago, it would be now 2030, it has been discussed in, uh, in uh, many ski clubs and uh, it's on the way. So 2030 is the normal. We have much farther trained ski instructors and, and guides who take over more systemic um, and beautiful tasks. This again, uh, grown over old ski lift in Hokkaido. So the stories of change we mindfully shared over the last years have created a critical mass movement. So by 2030, there is a critical mass movement of activists, of uh, transformative designers, and the stories we share in a mindful may, way, meaning we tell stories like the stories I told about Japan and the carbon emissions and the benefits of doing that conscious journey. Um, we are more mindful um, what kind of Instagram stuff um, and somewhere else we post, how we guide the masses of people. And this is one way to create a positive mass movement, not negative mass movement. And finally, in 2030, in our visions, our powder alert, which makes us excited, will be that we are mindful in nature, with us and others, and in places we ski. So it's much less about ski in, ski out, be fast, you know, have done this, have done that, make a mark on it. But as with this experience here in Svalbard, in uh, Spitsbergen, that polar bear climbing out of the frozen fjord on that ice, shelf. Such experiences can also be done locally with um, you know, a more mindful view on nature. And this is we really part of the new normal in 2030. This is about 
one kind of entry point to how ski touring, we as ski tourists, will be in 2030. And I think it's very positive. I think it's super exciting. Um, so in our beacon check, we also think about the melting snow. We don't forget about this. So just a quick point on this here. The melting snow, as it used to be, hunting the snow line. I guess many of us have been living like this, me included. This is Greenland. And I've skied all over the world. So I'm uh, one of the lucky people, mm, you know, being raised and grown up in a, in a time where we could just travel anywhere and live our passion and ski almost all skiable mountain ranges that there are and creating a huge negative climate footprint. So this is not the normal anymore, already now, and will be even less. And we're looking more into sharing such experiences in different ways, but also making aware that such experiences can also be done much more regionally. And if we travel far, which I think we should still be able to do, then we have a kind of carbon budget, each of us, that is fair in terms of global budgets available um, in the future, now in the future, and we'll find ways to balance this out. But clearly said, this amount of travel, I think will not be possible anymore. Melting snow as used to be. So this has been a ski instructor's inter-ski conference, 2015 Ushuaia, Argentina. 700 plus participants traveling there. And you can see, I made a map here where the ski instructors traveled from. Um, in total, 20, about 20 million kilometers and about 1,800 tons of CO2 equivalents just to get there, just for a meeting of a couple of days and skiing together in one of the most remote places in the world. I was invited for a, 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 a talk on sustainability and I, I showed these maps here. People didn't like it very much because it reminds us on you know, something that's not right, what we're doing there. So we need to be much more conscious in, in our travel uh, in the future and, and really think about what is necessary and what not. Just for comparison, 1,800 tons CO2 is about half what um, a quite large ski area uh, in the Alps consumes per season with about 1 million skiers. More I don't want to say about the negative and the problems. Um, and I do think we have talked enough about this. It's really time to act and not question anymore that there is a problem. The problem is huge. So what are the fresh tracks? What's the way forward here? And we should all be aware of such, let's say, um, foundations, global challenges. I mentioned before the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which is beautiful to have because it's a global agreement and the agenda 2030 to achieve improvements in these SDGs is also beautiful to have. But we are short in time and that's why this UN agenda or decade, so the next 10 years of action, as you can see here, is called local people action. So local on, this, on the side where we are from us and by us together. So that's uh, the kind of framework we have. And we need science to inform creative transformative action. We don't need alternative truths. We just need science, transparent science and the foundational kind of agreement of data and knowledge that we can work with. And one of those are the planetary boundaries, which you can see here, where um, you know we have one of these scientific frameworks, which shows us where we have an overshoot about what the current capacity of our ecosystems are. And this obviously is done in different places. This is already a bit old, so this changes. Climate change is meanwhile further out. But this is shown here because we should not forget about other aspects. Climate change is super important, but there's other ones like biodiversity loss um, and biosphere integrity and biogeochemical flows, which are as important and they are connected. And it's all not only about the climate, it's also about social changes and these are showing you the donut economics, donut economy model. And we can see here, in addition to the 
more ecological planetary boundaries outside, which we should not overshoot. And we're seeing the red overshoots here. We also have the shortfalls on social aspects, for example, health and education, um, um, equality uh, and, and peace and justice. So our assessment needs to be systemic, not just on travel emissions, also to remind us on this. And so it's not only about climate, one project here of a friend, a friend who is an entrepreneur and one of those beautiful people who take risks to um, bring us forward. He loves skiing like us and he developed part of project in the Georgian Caucasus, in the Lesser Caucasus, in a very, let's say, culturally different region. Um, so it's really hardcore what he has achieved there with his equip and his local people. And he offers cat skiing. So people, not maybe the ski touring people, but people who focus on downhill and are maybe not so used or eager to climb up. So we can criticize this, obviously. You have to fly to Georgia and you're using uh, snow cat diesels. Okay, similar to criticize anybody who goes or flies into ski areas. And this is, I think, is, a, is correct to criticize and, and reassess if this is necessary. Um, as we have to criticize any kind of mobility and any kind of human activity uh, in this realm. So, but it is part of our sports. It is part of skiing and there's a social side to it and a more complex side. So before we judge too fast, um, I like this project because first of all, there is a person who takes things into his or her own hands and takes a risk to bring something forward and who is super engaged in local fair economic development by giving jobs to local people, by connecting the, this part of our planet more with the Western part. Georgia really wants to be closer to, to Europe, also in terms of the geopolitical um, regional conflicts uh, with uh, Russia, for example. So this is a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of, um, a mission beyond skiing that one can see in such a project, giving fair jobs and education and equity to local people, thinking about the social um, aspect of sustainability. And also here, this friend of Powder Project, Ingo, he brought um, hemp bricks, hempcrete bricks, so hemp fiber and, and limestone mixed um, bricks over um, here from uh, another entrepreneur in sustainability, Werner Schönthaler in uh, South Tyrol in the mountains, also a ski touring person. These are all ski touring people. So all some of us. And he took this effort to bring this hemp fiber stone here, which is carbon negative, to try to bring change into the building industry, which is only concrete, basically, and, and conventional bricks. So it's, it's locally very climate um, problematic how it's being built there, like in many countries. And so one of the positive aspects he brings in is as well, this kind of knowledge and culture change for the cost of a cat skiing operation. So we can have our own opinions, but this is the kind of assessment I suggest of critically seeing both problematic and also many, many positive parts. Um, and at the end, having people who take transformative action. One term that is relevant for us is resilience because it relates to any system, ecosystem, social systems that continuously have this kind of wavy patterns of growth, of conservation, of release after or with the crisis and of a new reorganization phase. It's called the resilience, adaptive waves. And this is important for our topic as well because Nothing is always a stable system. Everything undergoes such wavy patterns. And so there are release phases which give us the need and the chance to reorganize to a new kind of conservation phase. And this is where innovation takes place in systems, the reorganization and new growth phase. So we should be aware that right now there is a release phase with different types of crises coming together. And this is now not only the need, but also the chance to develop something new out of this that is more sustainable and also more enjoyable. 
Another term just I want to throw in here is regenerative tourism. So the terms of regenerative, and uh, it's the only definition I put in here, the only text block in the entire presentation. But as you can read here, it goes beyond um, sustaining itself. It is about renewing. Um, it's about um, giving back to the places we have been um, in a very simple translation. So we as skiers, we as ski tourists enjoying so much the place we go to definitely have the, um, let's say, the responsibility, but also um, the beautiful chance to redesign and co-design and regenerate these systems uh, together. Also, just one quick thought is this graph. This is about designing across scales. We see here eight scales of governance and of space. It starts with green chemistry here. That's where all originates. Carbon dioxide is part of green chemistry. About raw materials, products, buildings, communities, cities, landscape, regions, and the transnationalities. This is a kind of autopoietic spiral of complexity that is part of our current research. And so any kind of decision, when we talk about what we as ski tourists should do or should not do, should encompass this complexity. Any decision we take about, let's say, what material we buy is here, material, or how we wax the skis, it's green chemistry, or how we live, where we, where we book the hotel, or in what kind of destination we go, or if we buy local and contribute to bioregional economy, or how we travel across countries. This is all can be shown in this trans scale design uh, spiral here. And it should just make us aware that it's really the connection of things that is important to say. And carbon is one important connector in such systems, but there are more. Design with nature is another component. This is a, a recycled circular saw blade from a table saw. Um, and uh, these are knife blades lasered out. Uh, we make these small knives from it just as a kind of fun auto tool that every ski tourer can use. And it's made from old steel blades. So it's an, a recycled, upcycled, whatever you want to call it, a knife. And so circularity <clears throat> is imminent in nature as design principle in two ways. One is designing out waste, which we're doing here. And one is designing in opportunity. So another kind of concept we can take with us for taking our decisions, our action is design with nature, designing in opportunity and designing out waste. And a knife is just a very simple fun tool to manifest in it. So um, in these fresh tracks, we also have uh, new destination business models that we need to think about. So <clears throat> how are destinations where we go to, where we ski, how they're managed. This is an example from Lax in Switzerland by Finding Affinity. And um, this is already a couple of years old, 10 years old about. Um, and they already had these ideas of going 100% on-site renewable energy, 100% renewable transport, being neutral in water, zero waste, etc., etc. So these thoughts are being put into place and we should ask for this. We should be part of this. This was just uh, published in the German Black Forest, um, which now has fantastic snow as well. And so since skiers are closed, what they did, and this relates into new thinking, new business models, which are fun and exciting, is about being alone, the tightly alone on the you know wide, big open piste, because you can rent it, you can rent this, ski lift for 150 euros per hour and you can bring your own household um, and ski for yourself so it's interesting to see how this crisis the release phase brings us into more creative reorganization modes and this leads me to the last slide on this chapter is change means chance this is an example from greenland when we skied there we were on research endeavors and this is about designing more resilient communities in the Arctic who undergo very rapid change of climate aspects. So for fishers who used to fish on frozen sea ice for seals, suddenly don't have 
um, stable sea ice anymore and they have to reinvent their business and their life. So this fisher here suddenly is also a tourist guide, both on the boat and also with the dogs. Um, and they find a lot of chance in these changes and we should also look for these chances and design them. Which brings us to the um, second last uh, part in here, um, but it's maybe most substantial in terms of practical things to do. So guiding in complex terrain. And um, I think my sister is um, here part, uh, uh, so I'm jumping in. So I learned a lot in the last uh, from my sister as a professional mindfulness uh, trainer and self-compassion trainer. And, um, and we had a lot of discussions, you know, why this practice sometimes to me appeared a bit to be, mm, let's say, um, discussed in a way that felt for me not so natural. And so I think many people who are out there have mindfulness built in with a question mark, um, where we have a very, these people have a very natural connection with themselves and with nature around. But I think often we are not aware of this and we can use it as a tool for change. We should be aware in this tool for change and this mindfulness that we are dots of complex systems and networks. So this here is real data from tourism community in Switzerland in the mountains. These are all tourism stakeholders from tourism supply chain, hotels, for example, ski areas. And they are connected, for example, by collaboration. It looks like a mess, like a chaos, but it's actually an audit network. This is a connection, a destination management organization in Andermatt, around Andermatt, three communities. And we can see here the colors are different economic actors in mountain tourism. And we all consume them, accommodation, gastronomy, activities, public service transportation, etc. And some are bigger, some are smaller. The size here in this case is centrality. So the number of collaborative connections that they share. And of course, here in this example, these are the big guys in the middle are the power players. They are the most connected decision makers. But also these peripheral actors down here, there's a mountain guide actually. These are all super important because the innovation often happens in the periphery of networks. Those who have more pressure to enter the network have more thrive to develop new things, take risks like the friend in Georgia. So here's where innovation is being spurred and we have roles in the system. We as ski tourists have certain functions and we should become more aware of our systemic functions in these social networks. In our tourism experience as part of this supply chain, so-called, these are the sectors from information to travel, to food, to accommodation, um, and to leaving. Um, so inside and outside destination. And this is an interesting framework because it shows us um, that in terms of climate and carbon emissions, the vast majority, about two thirds, originates here from transportation to and within the destination especially if you come far away, like from the UK. This is uh, for um, uh, French ski areas here, a couple of years old, but still largely relevant, where we can see the majority is transportation of the carbon emissions that we have to take into account. A big part is, the second big part, 20% or fifth of accommodation heating. And then we have the ski area um, activities in terms of carbon emissions, you know, much less. So these are the biggest leverage how often and how we travel and how and where we live. And we can go into more details. This is the energy consumption um, percent in the Flims Lark ski area. And we can say, if we just look at the, at the ski operation as such, um, the cableways here um, and the grooming, you know, make up the biggest chunk. And then heating as well and snowmaking is rather less uh, gastronomy is here. So this also helps us a bit to see the relations, this kind of data, where and how we move and um, how we, um, yeah, change our and adopt our behavior to bring down our carbon emissions and our carbon budget per capita per person. As we have seen, this is super important. So ski touring obviously doesn't need 
uh, grooming and, and cableways if we just tour. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, part of what we should also um, harvest in our um, changing world. In this kind of tool supply chain, and I know I'm approaching 45 minutes, and I would ask for a couple of more minutes, um, Kathy, if that's hopefully fine, and nobody's slipped away yet. Uh, yes, that's absolutely fine. Keep on going. Thank you very much. Um, so in our tourism supply chain, we are now at the planning phase when we start to think about what are we doing as key tourists in the future. And the first of all, I think, is less is more and slow wins. There's a picture a couple of days ago from the local mountain here in Zurich. I'm somewhere near down in the house right now, wherever. And um, yeah, so less is more. Um, it's been foggy down here. Um, the mountains are calling. But to be honest, you can also do very beautiful things where you are, where we are. So thinking as action into doing less and think about slow activities and, and, and gain more freedom in it. Planning, uh, we said before, yes, in the plan, become stakeholder of a mountain community. So let's not just go everywhere all the time. Let's just use the beauty of the virtual working capacities and um, and decide for a community we develop a relation with and be there longer and more often and maybe have part of our life there, at least in chunks, which makes us less traveling um, and having different opportunities in here. So this is an example of the Austin mountaineering uh, villages, which um, focus on this kind of um, slow tourism. I think there is a microphone on here somewhere. Also, in terms of big data um, and over-tourism, so digitalized avoidance of over-tourism in our planning already. This is an example in um, Italy, where this rock climbing area here was um, you know, refurbished, reopened. And to avoid too many people, they have an interesting concept. It's, it was crowdfunded here, the financing of it, um, this forgotten crack. And there's now limited access. And you have an app here to check basic in real time how many people are there. So technology and data can really help us to avoid and better plan this kind of over tourism problem areas. Same as this quite interesting um, software, skitouringguru.ch, ski touring guru in Switzerland and open countries. So artificial intelligence um, based on, on crowd data to support real time big data processing for more sustainable planning of ski touring for safety, for sure, avalanche data and so on, but also mobility opportunities, alternatives, um, different activities. And this helps us to take more informed and you know, easy decisions on how we can adopt our behavior to be more sustainable. Obviously, there are a lot of prosumer labels around a myriad of labels to help us decide for more sustainable alternatives as well. So mobility, we're traveling to the place. Um, yes, mobility should be less. For the first, it should be different. It should be shared. And at the end, integrate electric. So I guess this is the kind of role we need to think about um, when we reassess the so important mobility in terms of climate. We talked about mobility before, so we're going a bit into equipment. As ski tourists, we need equipment and this is um, something I'm not sure if any of us is aware of one of these many problems, and this is microplastics, which are being found anywhere in the world meanwhile. And this is a, a huge problem, and this originates a lot from our, as well, from equipment that we have. And so, first of all, again, like in mobility, consume less. Patagonia, obviously, with this campaign some years ago, um, managed to come out again in this speech as well. But yes, um, buy less. And Patagonia just these days had a report in the uh, Swiss newspaper about closing uh, a, couple of some, a couple of shops and really changing to a more used gear company. So these are important steps and we should look for these companies for that that we have to consume. Um, and when we consume buy smart alternatives, this is the hemp fiber skis that we built, the latest uh, 
2018 uh, ISPO uh, Eco Achievement Award. So this hemp composite skis, and we have scientific data here, life cycle assessment of a standard ski um, and the carbon emission equivalence for one ski, about 23 kilogram here for grown ski. That was basalt rock fibers. Um, 2008, we developed this one, winning also an ISPO award was or reduced by about 30%. And today with this grown hemp ski, we're down to 11 or 12 kilograms. And you can see the differences here, 50% about reducing carbon emissions just by changing the materials, which is all available. And we need to push bigger companies to incorporate this technology and change the mass production. This is not what we are doing. We're just developing, trying to uh, develop alternatives that might have such advantages. And to be fair, if we think about a pair of eco-grown skis and uh, you know the carbon emission equivalence comparison, we are here about um, you know a pair 2022, 20, 24 or something, and the Gore-Tex jacket is here, and just one drive, um, 100 kilometers with a diesel car, for 600 kilometers. So let's say from Stuttgart in Germany down to the Swiss Alps and back, um, you know has like. Um, yeah, whatever, eight times the carbon. So this, the relation is important to say as well. This is where the big bang is happening without neglecting these other parts. And this is just carbon emissions. This is not microplastic landing up in, in uh, ecosystems and, and food chains. A reminder, design across scales. We zoom in this green chemistry. Not sure how many are aware that the ski waxes we use often have fluor and are based on paraffin. So it's crude oil and fluor is um, increasing in, uh, in, in, in nature and, um, and it's kind of inert. So there are alternatives out there. This is um, biodegradable, no fluorines and no paraffins and other oil components, vegetal and natural additives. So let's buy this instead of the other ones and let's nudge the industry that they change. You can get informed about this equipment as informed consumer, very practical, greenroomboys.com. Um, check us out, transparency tool, and they are, yeah, they create profiles of outdoor brands uh, around any kind of sustainability topics and they help them to move forward. So this is a good information source for us. Similar to this um, magazine from Sweden, Susten or Susten, Sustainable Outdoor News, it's also online available. It's so beautiful and rich to read, I recommend it. We are nearing the end of our tourism supply chain. We are in the destination, we are active. And uh, just one thing here, this is a small ski area in the Piemont in Italy. So let's revisit the small places. Let's develop a relation with them uh, and get back to the essence of skiing with a much lower footprint, a negative footprint, and a much higher positive footprint. This is the net positive, the regenerative part of bringing a sound economy back to these places based on a low negative footprint. Accommodation, similar things. We have heard about the climate potential of being uh, in, in, the, in the accommodation sector, heating, etc. The bigger, the more luxury, the higher the carbon footprint. So we should go down, less is more. Look at the bed and breakfast, look at the local refuge, uh, look into real local constructions and understand the culture, the building behind, the, the idea behind and meet the locals. And of course, there's also really interesting hotel and apartment concepts. This is the rock resort in Lax again, Switzerland. And this is interesting, not only because it uses you know, high energy standard and good insulation and kind of, um, uh, you know, heating that's based on renewable resources, but it's also a kind of hybrid concept where someone from outside can own an apartment, but he or she has to rent it many weeks per year. So it's not like a cold bed that leads to ghost towns, but it's still like a, a kind of warm bed hybrid concepts where Tourists can occupy the weeks when the owner is not there. And we go smaller. This white pot um, kind of eco luxury hotel, so called, is a kind of winter glamping. So there's also many creative ways to create 
a different ski touring mountain uh, experience beyond just the hotel that we get on booking.com and we don't think about what we're doing here. And even down, this is uh, fun stuff. This is uh, like um, a Tesla, in this case, uh, a Model S, but also in the three, you get like a, a camp mode where you can sleep in an electric car and get like a heating overnight and a campfire on the screen. So let's be a bit creative. There's beautiful ways to have different impacts and accommodation. Food, just one slide. It's obviously a super important part, just not to forget it. Um, this is a topic for itself, but local, seasonal, regional, um, less meat eating, I think that's uh, without speaking. In the skiing part, um, yes, our main activity, there are some people ski for subsistence, um, not only this hunter in the Altai Mountains, but also um, people living in the mountains. So skiing is an important industry that um, has also economic relevance, but we should understand the limitations like you see in the high Sierra of California Mammoth Mountain in very dry years, 2015, I think, where um, you know we should see the limitations when it does not make sense to push our sport against nature. And um, yeah, what we should incorporate here is avoid hotspots without creating new hotspots. So this kind of slow tourism, uh, you know, more relation with fewer places, but more in-depth staying longer relates to this problem. Uh, your neighborhood is more than your holidays. We try to live here. So whenever we get the notion of being a mountain inhabitant, and I have the luck to be mountain inhabitant in the Italian Piemont as well, it changed my, my attitude and my understanding that, uh, you know, suddenly we as tourists come into our backyards, our homes, and we need to find a new solidarity. And remember, this was part of the vision for 2030 that we found this past pandemic solidarity. Okay, finally, we are done. We chill in the hot tub. In the hot tub, we just take a couple of, of home messages here. So leveraging a ski positive climb for the future, that's our topic. And we close it back. So yes, design with carbon, design our consumption with carbon, minimize the negative carbon emissions, but maximize the regenerative footprint. Less is more, <clears throat> maximize quality, rethink the essential of skiing and of our experience carefully. Circularity, design out waste, design opportunity. That's a kind of design with nature and it's imminent in the products that we consume, for example. The power of networks, social networks, we have functions or the synergies of collaborative actions. For example, designer prosumer collectives for equipment. So why don't we just do a special edition for the UK Ski Club of hemp fiber skis just for the ski club? Why not? Travel once or less, but longer becomes stakeholder of a place. Yes, so this changes our relation and our with the place, but also with the sport and the um, transportation. Um, there's so many beautiful things to do with public transport. For example, the Trans France ski tour from Chamonix to Nice, about 10 days that we have been offering for many years. It's just traveling the places in a slow, conscious, low carbon way as ski tours. I to recommend. The role of digitalization, so mindful opportunities to travel smart, engage locally and ski more. We saw some examples. Share stories of change in a conscious way. So whatever we post on Instagram or not has meaning. And this is an example of skis we made from Arctic materials while doing research on Svalbard. And this tells the story of Arctic change, including the human influence and climate change in one product. So this is a storyteller. So act now as if tomorrow were the last day to ski for us, the last ski tour, so urgent it is. Be uh, conscious with nature, with ourselves and the people we ski with, the place we visit. And I see sustainability here as a global goal. Remember the UN decade for action, a local path and uh, a joint process. And with this slide, I wanna 
stop and sorry for a bit of uh, delay, but this topic is so interesting that we could take and talk for hours. So what we should do as skiers to me is not a question, it's a, uh, a given. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to some questions. Tobias, to what extent are ski resorts trying to reduce their footprints? I mean, I live in Andorra and at least from the outside, I just see more lifts and more snow machines as our snow gets less predictable. So it feels like they're fighting. It feels like a retrograde fight. They're trying to make themselves bigger and they're trying to produce more artificial snow as we're actually slowly moving in the other direction. Yeah, I guess there's a problem similar with electric cars. <clears throat> there's more and more cars coming out. They're getting bigger and um, you know faster and they're eating up the efficiency gains that we should have by them. Um, and so similar in skiers, I think it comes back to, to us as consumers, presumably skiers, to demand different, um, to mindful demand different um, you know, services there. Why do we need chairlifts that are heated, you know, that are um, uh, you know, fast and faster? I showed the picture of the small ski area. This is so low carbon, the ski area, um, but the mass of us, of skiers, just seems to not care, but go to uh, you know, those big and bigger places. And we have seen examples here in the Alps where places um, you know, had to shut down their lifts because of a lack of snow and a lack of you know, finances. And what most of them have been doing, either they are done or they're being acquired by bigger ski areas, or they try to re redrew the spur of quantitative growth. So they're investing in, in new and big, which means the entire spur of growth starts again, because then you need more people to refinance. You need like a, you know, a swimming pool when the weather is bad. You need like a, a mall, you need more parking places. So um, to your question, there is a lot happening um, over the years as in the outdoor sports industry as well. So we should acknowledge all the people and, and you know, who do good action. Um, I showed some examples, but at the end, it's, uh, let's say, just a, let's say a drop on the hot stone, uh, what's happening out there. Um, a question from James. Is there, a, um, is there a good online resource to compare carbon figures on different modes of transport? Uh, yes, there are, um, <clears throat> there are multiple ones. Um, one is, for example, um, My Climate. You know, um, myclimate.org or ch here in Switzerland is a one very non-profit organization. Um, and there are some, if you, if you Google for carbon um, emission calculators, and I guess you also have a program in the UK, Eagle Ski Club, if I understood right, um, where this could lead back to. But yeah, this is, this is so accessible and um, it should be part of our decision-making, our planning to assess the carbon footprint uh, as one element of the decision uh, process. A uh, question from Magda. What do you think about us skiing in the areas that normally benefit from no tourists during winter, using skis to get to places where walkers can't? Uh, is that having an impact on you know, animals hibernating in the winter? Are we sort of spreading damage by going further into the wilderness? Yes, so the example two days ago here with all the powder in Zurich, <clears throat> it was really tempting to ski down the, the steep slopes of Utliberg in the forest. I did not, for not only for the reason of young trees, but especially for the reason of uh, wildlife. Um, and we know that deer, for example, have up to 60 to 300 times more energy use when they have to escape in deep snow. And, and that's a problem for them for their health, for the resilience, but also for young trees, because then they start you know, eating up those young trees. So yes, we should be very careful when wandering into remote places um, where habitats are, wildlife, that is a huge issue. And there have been very good programs out for more than 20 years in the Alps, um, you know, environmentally friendly ski touring, where they look at, at very popular spots and they have maps and canal and signs where ski tours should be channeled and other places should be uh, left aside. So this is a, a very important responsibility for us ski tours. Uh, a question from Krasina. 
Do you think uh, ski tours, ski resorts will kind of leverage this time of COVID and put more importance on sustainability and crowd management in the future? I mean, I think we've just had a report come through saying it looks like crowds may not open their ski resorts at all this winter. They're certainly not going to open in February. Yeah, I mean, we saw this funny example of the guy with the propeller is in France zooming up the ski area. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of space for creativity and a new awareness how we play in the mountains. And as said in the beginning, I think everyone who skis should at least once climb the mountain him or herself to understand what it means to be just taken up there. So any kind of first move of kids, I think, should be climbing up you know, in a mindful way. Um, whatever they can do. And um, so we have examples in the Alps where ski areas or part of ski areas changed to a ski touring area. Davos is one example. And uh, we know that they alone for now could not survive economically. So here we need different shareholder models. And I could definitely see why not thinking about something where a ski club with a thousand participants, for example, would develop a kind of partner area and say, listen, we, I know we, we sign up, we have a club here and we have like a flat rate of, of chipping in some funds for a different skiing experience where maybe some old ski lifts are part of the experience for powder days or for accessing the touring terrain um, and making it possible to live from a different economic model than the mass. Um, you mentioned um, a couple of resources, um, but are there places, websites, magazines that kind of share kind of good practice? Um, there's a question here, a point from Pete about less is more is perhaps the biggest challenge. We need to frame a strong story to change our behavior and mindset as skiers. And it seems to me one of the things that's helpful to share is stories of success or or people who are doing it well or you know people who are being, being innovative. But there's so much information in the world, it's quite hard to find those stories. Yes, yes. Yeah, so um yeah, there are many out there and, and there need to be more. So um, first of all, again, encouraging us here to engage in sharing positive stories of change to um, you know inspire others and give good examples. This could be a project for a ski club. Um, um, you know, maybe case is a project for you <laughs> to bring it in. And there's also, um, we, I mentioned Green Room Voice as one, you know, share of positive stories. It's not about the problems, it's about really showing companies, um, partnering with companies to evolve in a more sustainable, regenerative way. And so this is something in terms of equipment, holistic assessment, greenroomvoice.com to look at. The other one that's more on outdoor tourism and in the winter season, a lot on skiing is the Susten magazine as an entry door, full of inspiring positive stories of, of people like us, of businesses, of destinations, places, countries who act in a way that's inspiring, yes. Yes, um... Question from Tokil. In reality, is there any way to justify sort of multiple trips per year? I assume you mean long distance trip. He continues, I don't think so. Maybe one trip by shared car or train. I should probably stop skiing and go back to kayaking and windsurfing in my local area. I think, um, you know, the idea of having uh, an annual carbon budget per person that brings in both the output but also the input. We can also sequester carbon, you know, by doing different activities, by planting trees, by uh, changing, um, you know, by building a house where we store um, carbon in uh, the hemp um, building products, for example. There's many ways, many creative ways to say, well, I have a negative carbon footprint because of traveling. I need to reduce this. This is no question. Um, but I do think we should not stop traveling. Um, I mentioned the Japan experience and also the Caucasus powder project with so many social, socially important aspects of traveling and, and cultural exchange. And I think 
this this balance to find is very individual. It should be based on science, on the planetary boundaries, as one example. Um, but doing less and and doing more and really taking this COVID pandemic also as a as a chance as an accelerator to rethink what will it mean? Could we spend, for example, from UK, could we spend in the future an entire month in a really good part of the season in a beautiful ski place? And just you know, ski as much as we can and do it. I'm I'm a windsurfer. I live far away from the windsurfing. So what I did in the past was zooming into the places, being disappointed because the wind was not there for the couple of days. Now I changed to say, well, what I want to do is taking once or twice, maybe once, three, four weeks, and go to the best place in Europe, Portugal. And then I will have beautiful windsurfing for sure in that period. And I have much less stress with equipment and traveling around. So this is me basically looking for that what you have in the UK, what I don't have in Switzerland. A uh, question from Alexander. Uh, to what extent are mountain guides pushing a shift to sustainable ski touring? Or do most of them just follow what their clients want? Yeah, that's, um, I guess, similar. The ski areas, do they offer what they think the client wants or do they um, the client ask for it? So <clears throat> also, I mean, many mountain guides we know are, are, of course, they are, they do the job because they love being with people in nature and they have a very natural connection to it. So I think they are um, one of the best ambassadors for these changes. But what we need to do is give them more chance, more support um, to you know, develop a kind of, um, let's say, even more systemic relation with the customer. And, uh, uh, and there are examples. Uh, one is ski tour in Scandinavia as a mountain guide who does everything on public transport. For example, you know, so I think this could be developed much more. I mentioned the citizen science and the mountain observatory by ski mountaineers, by, by mountaineers, by guides, by us, by everyone, um, to you know understand that we are part of this complex social ecological system and we have a function that we would not only in terms of less of the negative impact, but much more so think about the opportunities that we could bring in and create better experiences. Um, a question from Jill. Uh, regarding economic sustainability, how do you think that the less is more model can be sustained as countries strive towards economic growth, uh, consuming, etc.? Do you think it's possible to change people's behavior and mind to move towards a sustainable consumer model? Oh, yes, I'm a realistic optimist or an optimist, optimistic realist. And there's some research out there that um, the people in life are most successful who are optimistic and realistic. So both. So I think, yes, this is possible. And we have, um, again, good examples and illustrations out there for people who develop more sustainable regenerative product services and who can make very good living from this. Um, by changing a couple of parameters. And, and this is what I would also encourage to you know, take this opportunity to look into these resources like the Sustan magazine, like Green and Voice, to um, visit places like the Bergsteiger Dörfer, the mountaineering villages who focus on slow tourism and engage with the people and develop you know, a kind of relation. There's so many local people doing by nature. So um, let's say regenerative practices they don't even talk about it because it's unnatural to them. So we lost a bit track because many of us live in cities um, and uh, maybe don't get so much opportunity and don't take the time for it. But yes, there are successful economic models um, that um, often are hard in the beginning. <clears throat> but um, if we sit down, we could totally map out a couple of you know, good approaches that we could then even uh, you know, see what we can learn from them.